Hey Light Church, thanks so much for joining us today. We're glad that you're here. Uh, if you're new, we want to welcome you. Thanks for jumping in and I want to encourage you to visit our website, lightsandiego.com. It's got all sorts of information on there. For instance, we have a youth summer camp coming up and we have VBS for our kids. So be on the lookout for information for both of those happening in July. Also, uh, if you would like prayer, if you would like to give, if you would like to uh, find out more about what's going on or who we are, again, please just go ahead and visit our website. We'd love to see you there. And uh, right now we're going to spend some time in worship and then we're going to be spending some time continuing our series in the book of Mark, Who is Jesus? Let's get our hearts ready to worship. surrender this 
I love when a new Pixar movie comes out. Um, I think they're one of the best storytellers around and it's one of the reasons I love going to see a Pixar movie is because the Pixar short at the very beginning. It's just it's incredible how much they can capture in just a couple of minutes and how good they are visually and their storytelling. Um, and, and I just, there's something about it that kind of draws me in. And the reason I bring that up is because Mark begins his gospel with this series of shorts, like Jesus shorts. And it's this opening up that it's incredibly epic and big and broad and it makes his bold claim and then he goes right into telling these quick, punchy stories of Jesus showing up and doing something miraculous. And so we're going to be looking at five Jesus shorts, if you will. And we're going to be looking at some of the, the things that, the meaning that would have been significant to the early church in Rome. And if you remember a couple of weeks back, we talked about how this was a significantly persecuted church that Caesar Nero had blamed the great fire of Rome on the Christians. They were now hiding underground, meeting in the catacombs, and they were in desperate need of hope. And so Mark writes his gospel from the perspective of the Apostle Peter to really inspire hope and to ultimately answer the question, who is Jesus? Is Jesus worth all that they were going through? And one of the ways that he does this is by telling these quick stories of Jesus that all relate something really significant that would have really grabbed the heart of the early church and I think they're going to grab our heart as well. So we're going to be looking at the the model that Jesus kind of laid out at the very beginning of Mark's gospel. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 1 verses 16 through the beginning of chapter 2. And this is the five stories, five models we're going to see about Jesus. Number one, we're going to see his radical invitation that he extends to, to, to you and to me, but to the early disciples. We're going to be looking at his authoritative incarnation, that when Jesus shows up with authority in an intimate incarnational way. Next, we're going to be looking at his prioritized intimacy with the Father and how in all of the busyness and the momentum and the crowds that he was facing, he prioritized spending time with his father. Next, we're going to be looking at his compassionate indignation, uh, which normally those two words, compassionate and anger, indignation, don't go together, but Jesus somehow marries them in a really profound way in one of the stories. And lastly, we're going to be looking at his merciful interpretation, his invitation, incarnation, intimacy, indignation, and interruption. And the flow of this and the order of this matters specifically with the first one. So the very first Jesus short we're going to be looking at is this radical invitation that he gives. If you remember last week, Chris uh, did a, a phenomenal job talking about Jesus coming and preaching the shortest sermon maybe ever, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And I know what you're thinking, Benji, why can't you be more like Jesus and teach shorter sermons? And I'm sorry, I'm a work in progress. Um, but immediately after that proclamation, he moves in here. Mark chapter 1 verse 16 says this, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they, were, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And once they left their nets and followed him, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So the very beginning of this Jesus story, we see him show up with these ordinary fishermen, and he has this phrase, he extends to them, follow me. This is at the core of Christianity, this invitation. And so if you're new, maybe you're watching this and trying to figure out who Jesus is, understand that the ultimate goal of Jesus is not to create intellectual converts, not to get people to ascribe to a certain doctrine. It's to answer the invitation, follow me. Now, if you're reading this story, it sounds a bit perplexing, doesn't it? That here are these four men, two different fishing companies, in the middle of their work day, and here comes this person we know very little about at all. And he just says, follow me. And they drop everything. We know that some of these people had families and businesses. They had wives. They, and somehow something about Jesus was so compelling that they left him. And so a little bit of why, why, that, why that was the case. 
So in ancient Judaism, the kind of the social hierarchy was built around religion. Now in America, it couldn't be further from the, the, that reality. But in ancient Jewish culture, uh, your social status was linked to your devotion to God. And your devotion of God was linked to kind of the religious status you had. At kind of near the top of the food chain were these rabbis. Jesus, being identified early on, is one of these rabbis. And there was this whole sort of schooling system to become what was called a Talmudim, which is a, an apprentice or a follower underneath one of these rabbis. In order to do that, you would need to be the top of your class, and the top of your class would then compete under like a different few years level of learning. And then at the very end, if they thought you were worthy, you would have an invitation to follow a rabbi. So here comes Jesus. And he's talking to fishermen, meaning that they didn't make it through that gauntlet of intellectual ascent. And he looks at them, these common men, these misfits, these uneducated guys, and just says, I'm going to give you the same invitation as a rabbi gives to someone who's at the top of their class. And so for them, this is one of the greatest honors of all time, to be asked by a rabbi to come and follow in his footsteps, ultimately to become like a rabbi. And so for every ancient rabbi, there was these three goals to be with your rabbi, become like your rabbi, and to do what your rabbi did. And if you look at the life of Jesus, he has those same three goals extended, not just to these 12 disciples, but to anyone who would come and follow him, and that includes you and I. So here are the three goals, not just of Jesus, um, but of everyone who were to come and follow him. This is the goal of Light Church, is that we would begin to practice the way of Jesus as our rabbi. And these are our three goals. Number one, that we would be with Jesus, just in proximity. We would just follow him, abide with him. Number two, two is that we would become like Jesus. We would share his values and priorities, his character, and how he looks at the world and interacts with people and culture. And lastly, that we would do what Jesus did. More specifically, that we would do what Jesus did if he were you. So if you're um, if you are a professor at the local community college, if you are a doctor at the hospital, if you are a stay-at-home mom or dad, if you, what would Jesus do if he were you? And ultimately, these three goals encompass what ultimately the church is here to do, is to create a space to create disciples, or maybe a better word would be apprentices of Jesus. And this is exactly what we see at the very beginning of, of Mark's gospel. Come be like me. Now, just a, a quick illustration. Uh, this past week, I had the privilege of going to London uh, to get to learn from some different churches. And on the last day, we got to take a trip to Oxford. And it was the highlight of my trip. One of the reasons being is I could just sit in the oldest church at Oxford. And we got to have a question and answer with a few pastors with a theologian by the name of N.T. Wright. Probably quoted him a hundred times here at Light Church. Um, USA Today says he's the most influential New Testament scholar in the entire world. Uh, he is now teaching at Oxford, the head of the theology department. And so this guy is just a theological giant, a hero of mine. And his books have radically shaped how I understand the kingdom of God. And so we're sitting there and I'm learning from N.T. Wright. And up to this point, my relationship with N.T. Wright is I've invited N.T. Wright into my life. I bought his books. I've listened to podcasts. I've listened to lectures. I've invited N.T. Wright into him. Now, Oxford's a really interesting school. It's not like a normal university where there's large lecture halls and one prof. It looks like each college has a few professors and in the thousands of applicants they get, each professor will choose three to four students a year. Think about this. Three to four students a year and they will learn underneath this professor. It's an incredibly kind of different model. Now I want you to imagine this, right? My relationship to N.T. Wright has been I've invited him into my life, but could you imagine I show up at Oxford, some pastor from San Diego, and N.T. Wright just comes and taps my shoulder after his Q&A and he says, hey, I want you to come to Oxford. I want you to come and learn under me. I'm going to choose you out of all of these people, all these applicants, and I'm going to look at him and I'm going to be like, I didn't even apply. And to my shock, it would be this incredible honor and also this surprise. And I would have to make this decision. I'm like, am I, am I gonna go sit under N.T. Wright? And this is a very exclusive invitation that he's just given me. And that, that would be shocking, but, he, but I would take it a step further. Could you imagine if N.T. Wright was walking around Oxford 
and he saw a plumber fix, fixing the pipes on one of the old buildings. And he goes and he says, would you like to come and be my apprentice? Would you like to come and sit under me and learn under me? And this plumber fixing the pipes in Oxford would just be like, I've, I have no education that would qualify me to do that. I didn't apply. I didn't. But in this invitation, there is this thing that he's like, yeah, I would love to do this. And this is kind of the, that same kind of level in the ancient world that here comes this rabbi, and at this time is becoming more well known to these people in a completely different trade. And to their shock and the reader's shock, he gives them the rabbi invitation, come follow me. And here's what's amazing. We find out later in the gospels that Jesus takes the same invitation, follow me. And he says, if anyone would follow me, meaning that the invitation is as rich and shocking as it would have been back then, it would have been if N.T. Wright invited me or a plumber to follow him but it's not exclusive. It's extended to everyone. But here's, here's the deal. Oftentimes, we have thought of our relationship to Jesus as something we invite Him into rather than an invitation that He invites us into. And that's the paradigm shift at the very beginning of Mark's Gospel. Maybe in this invitation you're exploring the idea of Jesus and you're, and you're thinking if you might want to invite him into your life. Maybe you've been following Jesus your whole life. But it really looks more like you've invited him into your plans, your dreams, your priorities, and hopefully he fits in with that. And when he doesn't, it's frustrating. and You have a crisis of faith. And, but we have to recognize that the invitation of Jesus is extended towards us and not the other way around. He's inviting us to be his apprentices, his disciples. Dallas Willard in his book, The Great Omission, says, The greatest issue facing the world today, with all its heartbreaking needs, is whether those who by profession of culture are identified as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human society. I love that. It's the greatest issue. It's the greatest issue of could we have apprentices of Jesus in politics? What would it look like for us to have apprentices of Jesus in the education system? What would it look like to have apprentices of Jesus mothering and fathering children? What would it look like to have apprentices of Jesus uh, work in the judicial system? What would it look like if you stopped considering inviting Jesus and you consider the invitation he has extended towards you to truly become an apprentice of his. The next story that Mark jumps right into is in Mark chapter 1. And we're going to look at his authoritative incarnation. It says, They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had, and here's this word, authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who is possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were also amazed that they asked each other, What is this, a new teaching and with, here it is again, authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Now, this is a really fascinating story. So Jesus shows up in Capernaum. He's from Nazareth, but he's now kind of camping out in Capernaum. It's a fishing village at the northern shore of Galilee. And they're in the synagogue. Now, a synagogue is not a temple. Temples where they offer sacrifices, it's grand and large. Synagogues are actually quite small. They're like small community centers where they do weddings and or mitzvahs. And it it's, could maybe depending on the size of the town, maybe 50 to 100 people would be in there. These towns weren't very large. And so you can imagine this community center, and in this community center, the, the men would gather each Sabbath to hear the law taught. And sometimes the visiting rabbis would come and do, and Jesus this day ends up being the teacher. And they're, they're shocked by something in the beginning of this quick story, is that Jesus isn't just teaching well, isn't just teaching a new interpretation, he's teaching with authority. 
And while he's there in the room with the men they would have seen every single Sabbath, every Saturday, years, one of them happens to be possessed by a demon. Somehow that's like normal. Like he's just there in the synagogue. And he just starts kind of freaking out and proclaiming, like, I know who you are, Jesus. You're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the Holy One. And Jesus quiets him down. And once again, the, the note from the synagogue is not like, whoa, Fred was demon-possessed the whole time. We had no idea. Like, that's not the shock. The shock is Jesus is teaching with authority. Now, why would that be important? Why would that be significant to to the early church? Well, a couple reasons. One, the early church is having a crisis of authority. Does Jesus really have authority in the war that they're in, the physical war? And at the very beginning of the story, Mark just says, understand that in in your circumstantial war of, of Rome trying to literally persecute and extinguish the early church, there's another war going on. It's a a heavenly war that can't be seen. And oftentimes we don't give it enough credit and recognize Jesus has authority. If you want to know anything about Jesus at the very beginning of the thing, at the very beginning of his gospel, Mark just says, this is someone who has remarkable authority. That Greek word authority, exosia, is used um, a few different times throughout Mark's gospel. And every single time, each, each of the nine times, it references to a divine sense of authority. Whether it's over demons, whether it's over storms, whether it's in his teaching, there is this sense that you cannot overemphasize the authority that Jesus has. Now, what that means for us is rather interesting. Because as a culture, we have a really interesting relationship with authority. That over the past, I would say, 10 years, authority has really begun to have a very negative connotation uh, within our culture. If you look at within the boomer generation, largely their culture was built on a high, high value of loyalty. Why? Because authority was significant. Um, they're coming out of the, the great world wars and there is a sense that you do what you're told and you're loyal to your denomination and you're loyal to your pastor and your boss and you work at the same job your whole life. And somewhere around the 60s and 70s, as the Gen X begins to emerge, is that the authority becomes largely in question and authority is now switched to authenticity, that we don't really trust authority unless you're authentic. We trust people who have authenticity, and that kind of kind of breeds even into the kind of millennial age. But what's happened over the past 10, 15 years is authenticity has been under attack. The people who've been the most authentic oftentimes are the people who right now getting canceled within our culture. And so now we've moved from authenticity to autonomy. That, well, I guess, I guess it's not enough for me to have authority. Even if it's authentic authority, I should probably just only trust myself. I am the ultimate authority, and I am the only one who can determine who I am, my identity. And in the middle of these large cultural swings that were underneath, I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus, in his invitation to follow him, is inviting us to reconsider the authority he has in our life. It's not an authority like we're going to think of some sort of dictator who's trying to extract from us all of the good in our life, but rather the authority he has is one of a a loving, gentle father wanting to guard and protect their children, wanting to provide for their children, wanting to lead and guide. And if we have a negative view with authority in our culture, we have to make sure that does not seep in to our understanding of who Jesus is. And so what areas of your life have you restricted Jesus' authority in that he might be wanting to just kind of open up our fingers today and let those op- that, the open-handedness come to him. The next quick story that happens is that we talked about his prioritized intimacy. Mark 1, 29-39 says, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her took her and helped her up. The fever had left her and she began to wait on him. Now, this is the only gospel that gives us details. Why? Because Simon, also known as Peter, is writing, is telling Mark this description. This is an incredibly significant story to Peter because this is his mother-in-law. 
That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. That's key. All, so everyone who's sick or demon-possessed shows up. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many, not all, many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they explained, Everyone's looking for you! Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. I mean, this is, this is such a confusing story on many levels. So Jesus shows up to Peter's house, which, by the way, archaeologists have identified. I, I've actually, I was there a few years ago. You, you can walk from the synagogue. It's maybe a couple hundred yards away to Peter's house. So he moves from the synagogue to there because Peter's probably being like, Jesus, can you, can you come? My, my mother-in-law, my wife's mom is, is dying. Jesus comes helps her up, says as he's helping her up, is kind of how the, how the Greek reads, the fever leaves her. And word of this spreads, word of Fred from the synagogue getting, you know, delivered from demons spreads. And so the, says the entire town shows up in this small house and all the sick and all the demons, he's, and Jesus is healing a lot of them. And eventually it gets so late that he's like, okay, I gotta, gotta take a pause. And then Jesus like runs away. He just goes and leaves in the, in the night. It's, it's early morning. It's not even light yet. And you can imagine there's, there's still a line out the door. I mean, this is like Black Friday at Walmart kind of stuff. I mean, like people are there because they're wanting a little piece of this. And, and so it says that Jesus um, is off there to, to go and to pray to a solitary place. And Simon and his friends are looking everywhere for him. And once they found him, we have no idea how long it took. The response is, everyone's looking for you. Meaning, shouldn't this be your driving priority? Isn't the need of the day, the pressure of the crowd, doesn't this mean anything to you? And Jesus gives a really shocking statement. And he says, we got to go to the next town. I have to go and preach because this is why I came. I can't, could, you, could you imagine the shock of the disciples? Could you imagine just being like, Jesus, don't, don't you get it? Like, this is, this is a thing. Like, you invite us to follow you and you're, you're this growing kind of wild new leader. And what if all these people are still needing to be healed? And so three things that Jesus prioritizes is it is intimacy that really needs to do this. Because again, one of the things that I love about Jesus is Jesus models for us how to handle pressure. He has so much pressure. And, and similar in today, so much of this, so much pressure. And in the middle of it, please hear me, Jesus prioritized intimacy with his Father. And we need to prioritize intimacy with Jesus. So three things keys that we see in Jesus's practice here. Number one, we see hiddenness. We see the sense that like Jesus was trying to not, uh, not grow his fame at this point. He's, he's practicing this hiddenness. The secrecy of, the, of this hiddenness motif is an inherent part of the fabric of Mark's Gospels. On three occasions, demons are, are told to be silent. Jesus commands silence after four different miracles. Twice the disciples are commanded to be silent. And twice Jesus withdraws from crowds to escape detection. There's something about Mark's gospel that keeps telling the reader that Jesus prioritized this hiddenness. And again, remember, he's writing to a hidden church. that They're probably wondering, like, we're going backwards. We're losing our influence. And this is a reminder that in the hiddenness of Jesus, that, that this is actually where the, the true fruit of momentum is growing. The next thing we see in Jesus' prioritized intimacy is just quietness. And it says that he went to a solitary place. The Greek word is eremos or wilderness or lonely place. We see, the, we see this show up six times, this word, 
solitary place or wilderness six times in the first chapter. So there is this theme of, of quietness, wilderness, lonely place, six times in one chapter that Mark keeps referencing. That there's something about those lonely places, those hidden places that the early church was literally in as they were having this be read to them, that God shows up. And I think in a world that is absolutely bombarded by pressure, swept into the current of the to-do lists of what's needed from us, there's something we can learn in a modern context of Jesus prioritizing, I need to get away. Eugene Peterson, in his book, Where Your Treasure Is, says, the silence that makes it possible to hear God speak also makes it possible for us to hear the world's words for what they really are, tiny and unconvincing lies. And the last thing he teaches us is this idea of of centeredness, that when he's away, in the quiet, in this hidden place, is where he, he re-understands this, that, I love that phrase, this is why I came. It centers him around the mission of his father that he is there to accomplish. Henry Nouwen says this really well. He says, Jesus does not respond to our worry-filled way of living by saying that we should not be so busy with worldly affairs. He does not try to pull us away from the many events, activities that people make up, that make up our lives. He asks us to shift the point of gravity to relocate the center of our attention to change our priorities. Jesus does not speak about a change of activities, a change in contacts, or even a change of pace. He speaks about the change of heart. Jesus has to be and become evermore the center of my life. It is not enough that Jesus is my teacher, my guide, my source of inspiration. It is not enough that he is my companion on the journey, my friend and my brother, Jesus must become the heart of my heart, the fire of my life, the love of my soul, the bridegroom of my spirit. He must become my only thought, my only concern, and my only desire. Charles Spurgeon says, let it be our delight to find our society in the circle of which Jesus is the center. This is the the model that Jesus shows us. Two more quick shorts. Fourth one, that there's compassionate indignation. So Jesus leaves this growing crowd in Capernaum, and this is what happens next. It says, A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant, which means angry, like furious. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See, you don't tell this to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside, and here it is, in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him for everything. Now, if you're reading this in the NIV, which we just did, there, there's a shock when it says that this man comes to him, he has leprosy, and it says that Jesus is angry. Um, and if you read it in every other translation, it says that Jesus is moved to compassion. Why in the world would the NIV translate this word as indignant, angry, when every other translation translated as he's filled with compassion, how can those two things be connected? Well, the NIV is using one of the most significant ancient manuscripts of it that uses this word for anger. And the later manuscripts, which the other Bible translations are using for this specific verse, it, it does say compassion, moved with compassion. And I think the question is, well, what's going on there? And I think that both of the ideas are present. The question is, what has moved Jesus to compassion is actually tied to why he's angry. You see, he's not angry at the man. He's not upset that he asked a question. He's not upset that he asked to be healed. He's angry at the condition of sin in the world. 
He's angry that leprosy exists. He's indignant that this man has suffered so long. There is a righteous anger in Jesus. We see it at the temple when he flips over tables. We see it when, when they don't let the little children come. This same Greek word shows up that Jesus' anger is righteous. And when he, when he sees the suffering of this man, there is an anger that comes up in Jesus. Says, this should not be. This was not a part of my father's created order. And at the same time, the other manuscript says he's filled with compassion. Which one is it? It is bold. That there are things that move us in our life, both with a righteous anger and at the very same time with a divine compassion. As I'm recording this, we are still, as a nation, reeling from mass shootings that have happened in our country. You think about what happened in Buffalo and kind of this racist motivated killing of these innocent people what happened at a church just a, an hour north of here and then lastly what happened this week with those kids I mean it's it's overwhelming I'm, I'm in another country and my news feed is getting blown up with just this devastating reality of what happened in Texas right on the heels of these other devastating acts and what's happening in my heart is is anger this should not be. This is not okay. And at the very same time, I'm coming to tears, praying with other pastors who are with me on this trip. We're weeping because why? We are filled with compassion. These two emotions are not exclusive. They are, they are intricately combined. And this is the kind of God that we see. And as an early church sits in the catacombs and wonders, where is Jesus? We are introduced to a Jesus who is angry at sin and death and suffering. He's angry at mass shootings. He's angry at anything that comes against his created order. And at the very same time, he's filled with compassion for the victims of those things. And this is the Jesus we're introduced to, this beautiful model that we are in desperate need of. And so if this week you have sensed a righteous anger well up within you, understand that you serve a rabbi and follow a rabbi that identifies with that. And if you are just filled with compassion, understand you, again, you follow a rabbi that's done, filled with those same things. And if you've experienced both like myself and like so many of us, know that those two things go together in the model of Jesus. The last thing I just want to say, the last short, is in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. It says, a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum. Now just stop right here. I love this. I've never realized this before. I always talked about how Jesus left Capernaum. He left the crowd. And then if you notice, he just heals one guy. And then the next thing happens, he goes back to Capernaum. And I always thought he just kind of left the crowd and these people are like, will I ever get healed? And I just think it's so amazing that Jesus comes back to that same town. And while he's there, there's the people heard that he had come home. I love that. They gathered in large numbers to be there. There was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him inside, him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Which is a, a kind of a Markian nod to exactly Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have seen, have we ever, oh sorry, we have never seen anything like this. There's a couple of notes before we, before we close. The first one being that Jesus came back. And if you're in a season where you feel like Jesus has abandoned you or like there's this unanswered prayer, 
I love just the, how Mark tells a story that these people who thought Jesus had left for good, that he returns. The second thing that I think is really interesting is this is the only time in all four Gospels where Jesus calls someone son. It's, it's interesting to note out that it's, it's not this man's family that's bringing him down. It's four friends, which is significant because in that culture, family was everything. And somehow this, this, this person had no family. So for Jesus to see him and say, son, your sins are forgiven, speaks to maybe a deeper need even than his ability to walk again, with his ability to be welcomed into a family again. And the last thing that oftentimes gets overlooked, because there's so much about this story of like, it's the faith of the friends and what radical faith. And, but the whole point of this parable it says, so that you know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Take up your mat and walk. We cannot tell this story and not be compelled by the ultimate point of it, that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. He's the one who is able to cover what has broken us. Tim Keller says that God's forgiveness, while free to the recipient, is always costly for the giver. From the earliest parts of the Bible, it was understood that God could not forgive without sacrifice. No one who is seriously wronged can just forgive the perpetrator. But when you forgive, that means you absorb the loss and the debt. You bear it yourself. All forgiveness then is costly. When Jesus forgives this man's sin and when he forgives your sin and my sin, it reminds us of the cost it took. It reminds us ultimately of the cross. So in conclusion of these five Jesus shorts, we're reminded that there is a radical invitation given to you. Would you follow Jesus and not just invite him to follow you? We're reminded of his authoritative incarnation, that Jesus has more authority than oftentimes we give him credit for, and that needs to be recalibrated in our life. Thirdly, that we need, like Jesus, to prioritize intimacy with God. If, if you get one practice out of this, just make time to hide away into the quiet, to center your life once again around Jesus. To be reminded this week that is marked by such horrific tragedy that we serve a God who is both righteously angry at the evil of this world and filled with compassion as he draws near to the brokenhearted. And lastly, we're reminded of the merciful interruption that what this, this man brought down to the roof reminds us of, that Jesus would look at every single one of us and say, son, daughter, get up and walk. Your sins are forgiven. So you just join me in prayer? We want to pray for the, those grieving from the, the tragedies this week. We also want to pray that we would continue to hear that invitation to become apprentice under who Jesus is. Lord, we, um, Lord, this week we have been reminded of the crushing weight of a sinful world of evil, demonic evil, Lord God, that, that continues to just plague the world around us. And Lord, we just say we need a Savior. Jesus, we need a Savior. Come, come, Lord Jesus. Come in your mercy. Lord, that you would put an end to evil, that as your apprentices, that we would be about justice, we would be about working towards the end of evil in our world. And Lord, that you'd fill us with compassion. Holy Spirit, that you'd bring comfort to every heart that has been affected. What's gone on these past couple of weeks. And Jesus, we ask, Lord God, that you would continue to invite us. Even when we don't hear, keep calling. Keep drawing us into yourself, Lord God, that we would find ourselves in whatever circumstantial uh, makeup our life is, Lord God, coming once again to you. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain stay.
Thank you guys so much for, for j continuing to journey with us through the book of Mark and seeing these instances of when Jesus shocks us with his invitation and his intimacy and even his indignation and compassion. And um, my, Our hope is that Jesus would just continue to meet you where you're at and that it would shape and form your heart. If you have never made a decision to follow Jesus before and you're interested in that, if you've never been baptized before, we'd love to invite you just to reach out and let us know. We can send you a Bible and a journal. Uh, we'd love to journey with you on this. Um, I know you're always welcome to join us in person as well. We meet on Sundays um, at La Paloma Theater and at our chapel in the evening. So please come and, and say hello to us if you're able to do that. Um, and if there's anything we could do for you or pray for you about, let us know. Grace and peace to you.